All right, it is 6.02. Uh, we'll kind of start uh, with a few housekeeping items first and then get into the meeting, uh, but wanted to say good evening, everyone. Thank you all very much for joining us this evening. You are tuned in to the Eastern Placer County Town Hall, so hopefully you have joined the correct Zoom link. We have a uh, packed agenda with some fantastic folks from Placer County uh, that are gonna give us lots of great updates. So we thank them all for being here tonight and to Supervisor Gustafson for uh, putting this and her staff together this evening. Did wanna just touch on a few things. I saw one person ask a question already. Um, yes, only presenters will, are on camera tonight. This is a webinar format. We will be taking questions uh, in the form of the Q&A and chat buttons. I know everybody here is probably a Zoom expert by now, um, but if you have questions, you, there's uh, the Q&A and the chat functions at the bottom of your screen. You can type those in. Uh, we will try to get as, to as many questions as possible, and we will be taking questions um, from all of our presenters this evening. So while they're presenting, if you have a question, feel free to type it in while you're thinking about it. And again, we will try to get to as many as possible. Uh, you are tuned in, as I said, to the Eastern Placer County Town Hall, and I will introduce myself. Uh, my name is Lindsay Romack. I'm with the Placer County Executive Office and happy to be help moderating this event this evening. Um, I did want to just go over a few things that if you read the agenda, you know, but to just make clear for everybody, this town hall meeting is conducted uh, by webinar and teleconference. If you're listening to us now, you know that, uh, but there is no physical location open to the public. We are all participating remotely. And as I mentioned, if you do have questions uh, for any of our presenters, you are welcome to submit them through again, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen or the chat function. And we will be trying to take uh, and answer as many questions as possible. So thank you again for joining us. And without further ado, I would like to welcome Supervisor Cindy Gustafson uh, to give some opening remarks. Lindsay, you have such a great uh, speaking voice. Thank you <laughs> for moderating tonight. Um, thank you all for attending tonight. Really appreciate you taking time uh, this evening, um, we hear and read on social media a lot about Placer County and our lack thereof of transparency or lack of transparency. Um, and we've been doing these town halls uh, throughout uh, the pandemic. Since the pandemic started, we've tried to hit on key topics for you. Um, most of what you're going to see tonight are things that have been presented already to the Board of Supervisors. Staff um, are taking time out of their schedules to join us tonight to present those again, um, more specifically to all of you and to engage with you so that you can ask us questions or you can garner more information or we can give you access to other resources. So I really thank you for being here and also thank our staff for taking time uh, to go over some of this again, um, but at a time when maybe more people can engage versus during the workday when uh, we're in the Board of Supervisors meetings. So thank you very much. Um, we wanna share what the county's been working on, on housing in particular, but we also know that many of you wanna hear more, a little more about our COVID updates. So Dr. Rob Oldham is gonna kick us off tonight and after he's done, we'll have some public safety officials and uh, community organizations give quick updates. And then we'll get into the discussions with housing with um, Shauna Pervines and Crystal Jacobson from our CEDRA offices. So really appreciate you, Dr. Oldham, for taking time tonight to specifically talk about Eastern Placer and uh, COVID in general. I know it's weighing heavily on your mind as well as all of ours. So. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, uh, thank you Supervisor Gustafson and uh, thanks everyone for joining tonight. And uh, I know I've uh, provided some uh, COVID updates uh, to this group in the past. I'm gonna try something a little bit different tonight and actually try to do uh, a, a quick uh, PowerPoint presentation, but I promise we'll go quickly. And um, let me just try, first try to, uh, to share my screen here. All right, is that working? Oh, although we, we started on the first slide, so you, I hope yes. you're 
you're seeing here, this first slide says uh, Delta is different. So that's the uh, not an advertisement for Delta Airlines. Uh, that is uh, uh, unfortunately talking about our Delta variant, which is now um, over 90% of all the, the cases of COVID uh, in, in Placer County in the month of July were uh, due to the Delta variant. In fact, probably when we get the data for August, it's going to be uh, high, high 90s uh, percentage of, of cases. So that's, it is the predominant strain. Uh, now, um, spreading really quickly, um, and most of the reason for that is uh, because um, it, you get uh, much uh, higher um, transmissibility, uh, largely because of, of the uh, high, high viral loads with the Delta variant. So that's resulting in, instead of maybe one person infecting two people, as you see here on this slide, uh, can infect you know uh, five or six. And so, in, in fact, a lot, of, a lot more type of uh, super spreader type of events with, with the Delta variant. Um, and um, so there it shows you know, it's more um, infectious than things like seasonal flu, common cold, um, and other uh, strains of the flu that we've had in the past. Um, the hospitalizations is probably the thing that's most worrisome uh, right now countywide. Um, you, you'll see the uh, hospitalizations here. And actually, as of today, we're up over 160 uh, people in Placer hospitals um, uh, due to COVID. We do have a lot of hospital beds down in uh, Western Placer. Um, uh, the good news is, uh, well, actually, the other bad news is ICU uh, hospitalizations. We've actually peaked. So we're at the peak, the most ICU hospitalizations due to COVID we've had throughout the pandemic. And you'll see here we're approaching uh, the peak for hospitalizations, um, uh, uh, total hospitalizations. Uh, we're, we're not seeing, fortunately, the number of deaths that we saw back with the winter surge, uh, largely because uh, most of our seniors, where we saw most of the, de the deaths previously in the winter surge, most of our seniors are vaccinated. So over 80% of all of our seniors are fully vaccinated. And a lot of our other um, high risk groups are fully vaccinated. Um, I, I did uh, just touch base with Harry Wise with uh, Tahoe Forest Health System um, earlier today. And the good news also is um, Tahoe's doing a good job and, and Eastern Placer's doing a good job. Uh, so we're actually seeing lower rates of spread in Eastern Placer and hospitalizations are much, much lower. Uh, right now, he says only one patient at Tahoe Forest uh, with COVID. So that, that's good news. So I'd say keep, keep up the good work in reducing the spread. And that's critical, as you know, because we don't have as much uh, uh, hospital bed capacity, especially for ICU hospitals um, in, in Eastern, Eastern Placer. I will say, um, uh, and I'll, when we move on to the next slide, you're looking at the case rates. Um, you know, the, uh, I mentioned the case rate, this is countywide, uh, now over uh, 25 cases uh, per 100,000. So if you'll remember, the, um, we're, we're no longer in the state's tier framework with the different colors, but if we were, we would be deep in purple right now. So very high uh, rates of, of community transmission with the Delta variant. Um, again, the good news is uh, rates in Eastern Placer, probably about a third uh, of what you're seeing. Um, but among the unvaccinated, you'll see the orange line here, um, uh, significant um, increase uh, among people who are, who are unvaccinated. So uh, maybe uh, five times higher uh, the rates of, of spread as compo uh, compared to those who are vaccinated. And then um, again, testing positivity is also up. I'll, uh, so the testing positivity, you know, the percentage of tests that are coming back positive, now over 10% uh, countywide. Um, we, we are seeing more people getting tested too. And so I know the OptumServe site, for instance, there in Truckee, uh, they were, we were talking, the state was talking about scaling that back to only be two days a week. The good news is we were able to push back. And so that's still uh, operating uh, five days a week and with plans actually to increase the uh, operating hours for, for that testing site. And then uh, how are we, we doing on vaccinations? Well, um, as I mentioned before, uh, among seniors, we're doing very well, actually for, uh, we're doing pretty well for um, everyone 35 and, and older. Uh, you'll see here uh, on, on the graph on the left that uh, not so well for people under age uh, 18, uh, so less than 20% of those groups are, are uh, have, have even received one dose. Um, and then you'll see on the, the graph on the right, uh, the huge drop off in uh, May and June of vaccination. So we really had a, a, a good pace of vaccinations and that's dropped off uh, precipitously um, uh, over the last couple of months, but does seem to be ticking back up. Um, I think largely as a result of the, the, the Delta variant. Um, also there's some um, increasing some employer mandates. I know uh, from hospitals um, and now today, we just heard from the, the governor uh, for, um, for schools, employees in schools, 
uh, we'll start to have uh, some vaccine mandates in the in the future. So. Um, the, the other thing I'll say is for Tahoe, uh, you know, we're uh, actually, again, uh, Eastern Placer and Tahoe doing a better job, uh, I would say, as compared to the county overall, um, uh, slightly, you know, so pretty, pretty much on, on track with, with the rest of the county. Uh, but Kings Beach and Tahoe Vista, the vaccination rates are lagging. So we really tried to focus um, on uh, Kings Beach and Tahoe Vista. In fact, uh, we have a, a SNAP nurse a mobile uh, van that's coming up uh, has been coming up periodically, and it will be there uh, tomorrow um, as well. There at the um, uh, there in uh, in Kings Beach at the at the event center. And the last uh, slide here, just to say, you know, what are we doing? We're actually, we're doing a lot of the same things, but just kind of um, trying to improve our communication and uh, really um, uh, uh, try to increase access again to, to vaccination through our these mobile efforts, like the one I mentioned at the event center uh, tomorrow. Uh, I mentioned go, uh, really growing our capacity for testing, um, masking, and starting to emphasize uh, a little bit more around mask quality at the beginning of the pandemic. We uh, you know, were concerned about shortages of high quality masks. These are the N95s and KN95s and surgical masks. Um, uh, but now there's uh, ample supply of those. So really encouraging people, especially if you're gonna, it's, no one I don't think likes wearing uh, masks. So if you're gonna go through the hassle of wearing a mask, uh, probably uh, better to use one of the higher quality ones, particularly with the, the Delta variant, which um, spreads so quickly. And then finally around uh, contact tracing, uh, we're staffing up. So as with more cases, we're uh, needing more staff again to do the contact tracing. Um, but encouraging people to please, uh, call, when, when if, if you do get uh, contacted by one of these contact tracers, to please uh, take take their calls. They're uh, public servant, just trying to to do their job, uh, and I think actually a, a very important job. So uh, with that, I will uh, stop and see if you all have any questions. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Oldham. We really appreciate everything you and your staff have been doing over the past year and a half. You all have been incredible and I know helped out many times with many questions. I'm not seeing any questions from the public at this time. If anyone does have a question, again, you are welcome to submit it uh, via chat or via the Q&A. Um, and if you do come up with a question later after Dr. Oldham has uh, stepped off, we can always follow up afterwards. Supervisor Gustafson? Yeah, I just, I wanted to make sure people knew they could email us later with questions. And Dr. Oldham has just been, and his team have been fantastic at, at getting answers to your questions. So uh, you can send them to my email and uh, we'll get them to Dr. Oldham if, if we don't have any in the, although I see, oh, here's somebody asking a question, Lindsay. Yeah, a question, Dr. Oldham, about, um your thoughts on the outdoor transmission of the Delta variant? Sorry, struggling to get off mute there. Okay, uh, yeah, um, certainly outdoor is much better uh, than indoor, right? Um, and so we've seen that with other uh, with other variants that you know earlier in the, the pandemic. Uh, we don't have a lot of data right now with with the, the Delta variant and kind of understanding. And so as far as the restrictions go, you know, right now, um, not seeing um, mandates. I think there's not as much of an appetite for, for mandates right now. Um, but uh, certainly there's a, uh, a strong recommendation for um, universal masking, even for people who are vaccinated um, indoors. Right now, out, outdoor, um, certainly it makes sense for people who are in high risk groups to do so if you're really in crowded environments. So I think uh, that's most of the guidance is outdoor and crowded environments to consider wearing a mask. But in general, um, you know, out, outdoor is a, a lot safer than indoor. Thank you very much, Dr. Oldham. We appreciate that. Right, thank you. And I am not seeing any other questions at this time for Dr. Oldham. So Dr. Oldham, thank you very much. Again, um, we will follow up if any additional questions come in to Supervisor Gustafson. Thanks again, Dr. Oldham. Thank you. All right, up next on the agenda, we have our uh, public agency updates. And we are gonna start off this evening, uh, Lieutenant Paul Long from the Placer County Sheriff's Office is with us, so Lieutenant Long. Uh, feel free to take it away and provide an update. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Thank you, Supervisor Gustafson, and thank you to everyone attending. Um, I'll be fairly brief. The good news is we haven't had a lot of crime activity in the month of July, but we have had a couple of events that are worth discussing. 
Uh, you may have heard that on August 1st, there was a man who attempted to lure a 12 year old girl into a car through multiple inducements. Uh, this occurred off of Golden Avenue in Kings Beach. Um, you know, we pulled a lot of video from the area. We're running down essentially every vehicle we can find in that area trying to find this person. Uh, you know, the, the, the young lady involved was unharmed, did not get into the car. But um, uh, we posted that in our social media page and we are continuing to follow up on that rapidly. Uh, the homicide that occurred on West Shore often comes up. There's very little I can say about it since it's an ongoing investigation. We do continue to, any investigation generates leads as you go on. And uh, we are chasing down all those leads and we'll continue to do to so until all leads are exhausted. Uh, one thing we are quite confident in asserting and uh, everything that we develop as this investigation continues uh, supports that what we said originally. This was a very targeted event and we don't believe there's any threat to public safety at large uh, because, you know, through the suspect of this, this, the suspect of this event. Um, we also are having our annual summer slash fall trail break-ins. So cars left at trailheads, quite commonly Eagle Rock, also quite commonly on 267 in Martis Valley. Uh, there are window smash auto burglaries occurring. We uh, have had this quite happen quite often during this time of year. Uh, we are familiar with some of the players. Most of them are out of the Bay Area or some are out of Reno. And uh, we actually have a couple of suspects in our, our our sites right now that we're following up on. Uh, but it just goes to show, please don't leave any valuables in your car if you can at all avoid it, and certainly do not leave them visible or exposed because uh, it really invites these people to, they'll walk around the parking lot, we've seen videos, we've posted videos on our Facebook page of people uh, walking around the parking lot, looking into cars, finding what they want to steal, smashing the window and stealing it. Uh, the last thing is, uh, there is a, an old case of a uh, local chiropractor, Mr. Uh, Stephen Clifford, who had committed sexual battery on his, uh, his clients. This occurred back in 2001 uh, with quite a few victims. His, he, we arrested him and he disappeared prior to trial and remains at large. There's still warrants out for him. Uh, but this is actually going to occur. We were contacted by In Pursuit with John Walsh agreed to feature him as a suspect. So we're hoping that that will develop uh, some national or even international leads that have happened. And uh, in further discussion with that program, they've actually agreed to also air a video from the homicide to try to put that suspect video out into an even wider audience to see if we can uh, obtain more information. And uh, with that, I am open to any questions. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Long. And I, I think we're gonna run through all of our uh, public agency updates first and then circle back with each of you with questions. So if you do have any questions for Lieutenant Long, feel free to type them again in the chat or Q&A, and we will come back after the rest of our folks have provided an update. So next, we would like to invite uh, Chief Layton with the North Tau Fire Protection District to share his update. Thanks, Lindsay, and hello, Supervisor Gustafson. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so North Tahoe Fire, Meeks Bay Fire, we, you know, it's fire season and, and our, our personnel have been very busy. We've been assigned to the Beckworth Complex, the Tamarack Fire, the Monument Fire, the River Fire, and now we, we currently have a crew on the Dixie Fire. So uh, we send crews out during the summer. Uh, in, so in the event we have a fire, uh, there the crews will come help us. So we're exceptionally dry this year, and, and this uh, is, and is this year is no different than, than it's been in the past. So la the month of, Ju of July, we were the busiest month we've ever had in the history of the North Tahoe Fire Protection District. We responded to 388 calls. Uh, we are 100 calls more than we responded to last year at the same time. So we we're about, you know, about 220 calls last year in July, uh, and we were at 388. So you can do the math, we were, we were quite substantially uh, busier this year. Um, I wanna address an issue that I, I get a lot of, I wouldn't say a lot of uh, inquiries on, and that is the burn bans and how it works up here in the basin. And, and I wanna take just a minute and kind of explain uh, the different jurisdictions and, and what I, my role is as the fire chief what my area of responsibility is, 
and then what the other areas of responsibility are. So I'm the fire chief for North Tahoe and Meeks Bay, which means I cover the dis the areas from the state line in, in, in Kings Beach down to Emerald Bay. And um, I'm responsible for basically the businesses and the houses in and around that district. Now in, in on the North and West shores of, of Lake Tahoe, we also have forest service land and we have state parks land. And so the forest service land is, it's called the Lake Tahoe Basin Management Unit. It's uh, operated under the forest service and it kind of surrounds the whole the whole lake. It's by county, it's by state. And if you, if you, you put a ring around the lake, that's what is considered the Lake Tahoe Basin Management Unit from the Forest Service side. Now, inside of that, you have North Tahoe Fire, Meeks Bay, you have Lake Valley, South Lake Tahoe, uh, Incline Village, and you have Tahoe Douglas. So you have fire districts that are inside kind of the Lake Tahoe Basin Management Unit area where the homes and where the businesses are. Um, and so that kind of explains how that is. So my responsibility in May of 2024, uh, so in my fire district, I have the ability to determine what those fire restrictions are. And on May 24th, we determined, I determined that the fire restrictions that we were going to use were the most uh, uh, strict that we possibly could. So we do not allow wood burning and we do not allow any type of charcoal. Uh, however, you can, and that's, that's, that's any time of the year um, uh, in this uh, wildland season, this, this summer. But you can burn char, you can burn propane, and you can use gas like a like a barbecue, unless it's a red flag warning. So the Tahoe Fire and Fuels team is comprised of the other regional fire districts, and we've all have adopted the same type of uh, of fire restrictions. Um, so that brings me to inside, kind of inside my fire district that I'm an area that I'm not responsible for is the state parks like Sugar Pine State Park is between Elder, it's kind of in El Dorado, Placer County, it's kind of on the, on the line, but I, I go through that area to get to the south end of my district, but I'm not responsible for Sugar Pine or any of the state park areas. So I have no authority or jurisdiction to say what the fire restrictions are. That's under the state parks. Um, on the 89 corridor, which is from Truckee to basically Alpine Meadows Road, is a different forest under the Tahoe National Forest, and they also have their own restrictions. So you'll drive along the 89 corridor and you'll see a campfire there, right? And so their, their fire restrictions are different than ours, but I have no authority to tell them basically what to do or, or how, to, how to do it. So um, I just wanted to make that clear because I think there's some misconception or some confusion that the North Tall fire is responsible for all the fire restrictions around the lake. Now we try to be good neighbors and we try to um, you know, talk to our friends uh, at the Forest Service and at the state parks and to get on the, on the same page and try to have the same fire restrictions. So I, I, I understand uh, some of the confusion and maybe some of the, the frustration that's out there, but rest assured, in the area I'm responsible for, we have the best fire restrictions you possibly could have. Um, that brings me to, um, we, ha we have had a couple fires that have been in my fire jurisdiction. The Rubicon fire on June 9th was uh, uh, 2.6 acres. It was started by a down, power, a down tree into a power line. Uh, no homes were lost. Uh, it was, the, you know, we didn't have the red flag warning. The wind was blowing the right direction. We, uh, what we call is we dumped a lot of resources on the fire. So in, one of the things that we've increased this year is when we have a fire call, we try to send as many resources to that fire as we possibly can. We send air tankers, we send helicopters, we send um, multiple engines. Uh, right now we're a little short because of the other fires that are going on, but I make sure that I, I will send people out on the fires, but I make sure I have enough firefighters left in our jurisdiction to be able to protect our, our, our people and, and, our, and our, our businesses and our, and our structures. Um, on July 28th, we had a lightning holdover fire, which was the Barker in, up in Barker Canyon. Uh, that was 0.2 acres. That was on Lake Forest or US Forest Service, Lake Tahoe Basin Management Unit area. So we initially, my fire district initially assisted them and they were 
they stayed on it for a couple of days and, and that didn't, uh, that didn't spread it, spread at all either. So I just want to reiterate, you know, what, what can we do? Uh, you know, we can create defensible space around your home. Uh, please continue to do that. Uh, you know, we offer free defensible space inspections. Uh, please visit ntfire.net and sign up and we'll, we'll come out and give you inspection and, and help you and see where we can uh, create some space for you. Uh, remember outdoor fires that burn anything other than gas are prohibited in the North Tall Fire District protection area. And this includes charcoal grills. Uh, practice in home hardening techniques. And like I've talked about before, uh, get, get your go to-go bag, have the stuff in it that you need, be prepared for, you know, have face masks, sanitation supplies, your flashlight, clothing, food, water, have some things where you can be out of your house, you know, for several days. And remember to, to take care of your pets, bring some food for your pets and pay attention to the news alerts, do plaster um, alert. That's, that's uh, our, our, our area where we're, we're able to uh, give you information in the event that you have to evacuate. And so um, other than that, Supervisor Gustafson and Lindsay, uh, I'd be happy to answer questions. I wanted to bring this, make this brief, but I wanted to kind of explain where, what my thought on, what, on the, the questions that I get on a regular basis about the burn ban and stuff. Thank you very much, Chief Layton. We uh, appreciate that clarification. And uh, it looks like we do have some questions for you. So stick around because we have one more public agency update. And again, if you have any questions for Chief Layton with North Tau Fire, or with Lieutenant Long, type them in the Q&A. And uh, after our next update, we will get to the questions. But up next, I would like to invite Justin Brolio with the North Tahoe Public Utility District to provide his update. Thank you, Lindsay. Hopefully everybody can hear me all right. Um, good evening, Supervisor Gustafson. Thanks for giving us a few minutes to update the community tonight during the town hall. And special thanks to Dr. Oldham for all that valuable information to start this off, really, really important stuff. So thanks for all that hard work. A few quick updates from the North Tahoe Public Utility District. Um, sewer construction projects um, on Highway 28 at Tahoe Vista Recreation Area and then Moon Dunes. People have probably seen that construction there. Projects are going well. Um, both projects are on track to be completed this fall. And you can check our Facebook page for video updates from our engineers. We've got some updates on there if you're interested in the details of those projects. Um, up in the regional park, Really excited to announce that our new 112,000 square foot synthetic turf soccer and lacrosse field is almost done. It's the turf's installed, it's looking really beautiful. Um, it's not playable yet, so please stay off of it. I have to kindly ask to not go run and play on it just yet. We'll be opening it very soon and it will be ready for fall sports, which we're really excited for. Um, over at the event center, um, I'm virtually at the event center right now. It's um, been a very busy summer. Got a lot of weddings, a lot of meetings. We're really excited to welcome people back um, and see everyone celebrating their special occasions and utilizing the event center for community events and, and all the great things we can do in the community. We've launched a new website for the event center. So check that out at North Tahoe Events. And then really happy to welcome the SNAP vaccine ban um, today and tomorrow. So come out and get vaccinated. It'll be right there in front of the back of the event center in downtown. Um, and then our Recreation and Parks Department is launching some fall programs, so keep an eye out for those coming out. And then last but not least, um, just your friendly reminder about water restrictions. Even though we have a big, beautiful lake to look at every day, we are in a drought, stayed in a drought. We're really lucky where we are. There's a lot of other communities that are hurting right now in terms of water supply. So just be water wise, observe your watering days, know your odd even um, irrigation days. And stop by our main office in Tal Vista if you need low flow shower heads or irrigation timers. Um, we've got lots of supplies to help you save water out there. So it's been a pretty busy summer. Thanks to everybody and all the agency partners on this call and everyone who's been helping out, um, keeping us safe and secure all summer long. Um, and hopefully we'll stay that way through the fall. So thank you all for the time. Thank you both. Good to see you. Thank you, Justin. We appreciate those updates and all that the North Tau Public Utility District is doing. Um, so again, if anyone has questions, uh, please type them in for uh, Chief Layton, Lieutenant Long, or Justin. Uh, Chief Layton, we did get one question. Uh, you spoke to the North Tau Fire Protection District seeing an increase in calls this summer. Uh, do you have any indication if that's uh, due to a more full-time population being in the area, or if you uh, see the increase tied to some other reasons? Yeah, um, 
That's a good question. You know, more people is definitely means more calls for us. Um, you know, on, on a regular basis, we, we utilize what's called a lodging barometer, which tells us, you know, how many of the pillow counts are being taken, how many, how many people are, are up here renting or so it gives us an indication of how many more people are going to be up for a certain day or a certain weekend. So it kind of, uh, it's a, it's a, a thing we use. We can kind of tell how many calls we're going to have for the most part. Um, I can tell you there's a lot of people out there recreating in the backcountry. Today, we're, we were out with our, our UTV, our all-terrain all vehicle, uh, twice up in you know, backcountry. People are up there bike riding, and they fall and, and get hurt. And then you know, we, we go up there, and we, we either rescue them or, or we take care of them you know, medically. So, yeah, there, more people are definitely gonna, going to create more calls. But you know, we don't really keep track of, of how many full-time residents we have or or anything like that. It's just not a metric that, that we keep track of. So thank you. Thank you very much. Supervisor Gustafson. Oh, I just, um, since I didn't see any other questions, I just wanted to thank Lieutenant Long and Chief Layton and Justin uh, for being here tonight and giving updates and all the hard work, every all our public servants are providing for our community. You know, it looks like at least Subjectively looking at traffic in town the last couple of days, kids are going back to school and it looks like uh, things are slowing down just a bit finally. And uh, and that's good news. I think we could all use a break. And uh, so thanks again for all your hard work. Now, while people are leaving, the fire danger continues to be there. So just a reminder to everybody. And one of the websites he mentioned signing up for Placer Alert uh, but also readyplacer.org will talk a little bit more about what you should have ready to go in your to-go bag and, and being prepared there too. So um, urge everybody, especially I was out at the River Fire on Wednesday and Saturday in Colfax in a town hall and then Monday in a tour of the whole site uh, of the fire down in Colfax. And uh, I can tell you that in those moments that people had to get out, not having a, a bag ready to go. They were panicked and stressed and you don't think about everything you wanna take. So please get ready and be prepared. Um, that's the words of wisdom from those who lost, tragically lost their homes uh, last Wednesday. And with that, Lindsay, if there's no, nothing else, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about our purpose tonight and housing. So, Obviously, we all know uh, and have been working diligently on housing issues in our community as a team of collaborators with the Mountain Housing Council, the county, for a number of years. Uh, the redevelopment agency, when we had a Placer County redevelopment agency, built housing, affordable housing in Kings Beach area. And then unfortunately, the redevelopment agency, uh, through state law, uh, they were uh, the powers of tax increment financing went away. It was very, it was a good pot of money for all of us. A portion of our property taxes went into those redevelopment projects, but that disappeared. When it disappeared, uh, we also subsequently went through a bit of a recession in, in uh, the 2008-9 timeframe. And so uh, the county finally is back in a very healthy position to start investing in projects. And for the last three or four years, uh, have been working with our Mountain Housing Council partners uh, to really move things forward. And we have a couple of superstars to present to you tonight. Um, many of you have met them before in various meetings, Shauna Purvines and Crystal Jacobson. And Shauna, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And I, I really appreciate both of you taking time to be here tonight to brief our community on what, what you are working on and what's coming up. And you don't get enough credit for melding and going after all the grant funding you do and all the programs that you do. Um, and I just, I wanna make sure that you uh, discuss that in your presentations, Shauna and Crystal, because you guys do a lot. And I think all too often people feel like it's just words, but there's day in and day out, a lot of work you're putting into this. So thank you. Thank you. I'm actually gonna um, start and share, share the screen really quick here, so. Um, bear with me here.
Okay, so I think, um, am I sure, let's see. Yep, you can see it now. You can see it, okay. So, uh, uh, thank you, Cindy and, and Lindsay. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and, it's, and I'm always excited to be able to talk about housing and particularly actually in the Tahoe area. As Cindy said, you know, the last um, three to four years, you know, we've really placed a, um, a strong focus on housing in the Tahoe Basin and it's um, in the Tahoe area, not just the Tahoe Basin. It's um, it's always been a struggle, you know, housing in and around, you know, the, the Tahoe Lake has um, struggled to maintain enough workforce housing um, to meet its needs. And these the last 15 months with COVID, it just got exasperated. I mean, it's, it, and it's, it's not stopping. It's every day we're hearing, seeing, um, and learning about, you know, people that are, have been long-term runners for years and worked in our community for years who are, you know, being um, asked to leave their, their rental housing uh, so that it can be moved out for the property owners to use it in, in other ways. And so um, it has been a very concerted effort to, to get um, projects. And we have some exciting news about ones that are coming online very shortly. And so Crystal, if I could get you just to move to the next slide, that'd be great. Yep. So I actually decided to start the night with a program that doesn't exist yet, but it's almost there. <laughs> we are um, uh, working with the town of Truckee, um, and they had uh, launched about uh, six, eight months ago, a new program called a long-term rental program. And it's working with a local company called um, Landings Local um, to help connect uh, people with second homes or um, you know, typically short-term rentals. Um, and into uh, long-term rental solutions. So um, the county is um, working now to put that program together. Um, and we're hoping that we'll be able to uh, bring that uh, to, um, the, um, to you by this fall. We'll actually bring in an item back to the board in September and hope to be able to, to launch that. Um, we're looking at this point with that one. Uh, to start with uh, 50 uh, local workforce and try to find housing for them. Um, it is, of course, based on funding and availability. So, you know, as we're able to grow that program, it is intended to be kind of a stopgap while we actually work towards um, actual construction and get some projects open. Um, we also did launch just a couple of months back um, a new program called Workforce Housing Preservation Program. And this is a down payment assistance program for actually home buyers. And we've always had a first time home buyer program, uh, but it's, it's pretty restrictive um, on income levels. And this program was um, custom um, designed um, and funded uh, directly through uh, um, uh, local funding. So the county and, and uh, some of the uh, TOT funding. Um, Crystal, you just flipped off. We went to another oh. slide. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so there we go. Um, and so we actually did, we launched that um, just a few months ago. We do have a couple um, of interest and applications, but, you know, again, with the local market, um, there's just not a lot of inventory. So, you know, we're really hoping that as inventory starts to open up, we'll be able to, um, you know, get this program um, out there and, and um, working to put um, permanent housing um, for sale housing, uh, you know, to our local workforce. So go ahead, Crystal, if you could move to the next slide. Thank you. And I think what we're most excited about uh, is some of the projects, the actual new housing that's coming online. And um, we have two um, that are, um, that will be online uh, later this year and early next year. We have Hopkins Village, it's 40 units. It's a for sale um, product. Uh, and it's um, targeting the, the area median income of 180%. And um, we're looking at the for sale prices in the mid 500. Um, thousand. It is a half flex product um, and we are accepting applications now. We actually um, had thought it was going to take us a little time to get these built out. Um, but we're able just with the demand, we're able to expedite that working with the builder and it looks like we may have um, most if not all of them open um, next year, so early next spring. And then Meadowview Place, this is a 56 unit affordable housing project out in Schaefer's Mill. And it is, um, we're actually calling for finals right now. So we're actually hoping um, that they will be um, done and ready and starting to accept um, uh, people moving in. 
by December or January of this year. So that is a more deeply affordable product, um, but still very much a need in the area. And then many of you have probably heard about the Dollar Creek Crossing. This is the property uh, in Dollar Hill. It's 11 acres the county purchased in 2018. Um, and we're working towards um, some designs now and um, launching an environmental review um, probably late this summer or early fall um, with a hope that we can actually start something um, in that area, at least a phase or a portion of that um, sometime next year. But it really just depends on, on that environmental review process. So Crystal, if you could switch to the next slide. So this is something I'm very excited about. And Cindy, you've been big part of the um, Tahoe Housing um, JPA. Um, this, uh, as, as Cindy had mentioned, or Supervisor Gustafson had mentioned, this is a kind of a spinoff of the Mountain Housing Council. And Mountain Housing Council um, spent about three years really um, pulling together the data and making, creating that awareness of just really how deep the need was. Um, and one of the, the things that has kind of come out of that is the need to actually have um, a, um, an organization or an entity that actually can get to the construction. So four of our larger uh, 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 employers, so the uh, hospital district, the Tahoe Truckee Airport District, the Tahoe, Tahoe Truckee Unified School District, and the Tahoe or Truckee uh, Donner Public Utility District created a JPA um, about a year and a half ago. And um, more recently, they invited the three uh, uh, public agencies, so the county of Plaza, the county of Nevada, and the town of Truckee to join. And our hope is um, with this uh, joint powers agreement that we will be able to actually fund new construction projects um, to so that we can start uh, building the housing that's needed for the workforce in the area. Um, go ahead, Crystal, if you want to go to the next slide. So some of the other ones, uh, the, these are kind of my last updates. And then I know I'm going to be turning it over to Crystal to talk about some of the work on the short-term rental. Um, accessory dwelling units, that, that really kind of took off this past year. Um, there were some pretty substantial changes in the state law that um, really made it a little easier to get uh, those built for locals. Um, typically, up in the Tahoe area, the North Tahoe area, we might have seen one, two permits for ADUs. Um, we are now, um, just this, just since January this year, we've had at least, I want to say it was 10 at the last count, um, and we are meeting with people weekly um, to talk about uh, constructing accessory dwelling units. And, and this just is an opportunity to provide um, some of that rental housing or that workforce housing um, with some, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to do now to be able to add either an accessory dwelling unit um, attached to your home, detached from your home, conversion of a garage, up on top of a garage. Um, the exciting part about it is the county is, um, we, we did uh, purchase plans um, and they are free of charge. They are on our website. So you can just do Placer County um, accessory homes and you'll get straight to our website. You can look at those plans um, currently, they are just the plans. They don't have foundations and they don't have uh, snow load roofs. But we're working with Nevada County, um, who in and the town of Truckee, where we are um, going to be uh, collectively um, creating a, a package, a full package of plans that includes both foundation and snow load. So we're actually hoping to roll those out um, early next year. But in the meantime, um, we do have plans available if you're interested on our website. And then the couple of last things that we are working on, um, we did amend our single room occupancy um, in last December. Um, and this uh, just helps to better align our ordinance with, with South Lake Tahoe and where we have um, funding coming in through the state uh, to be able to convert and improve uh, some of the older hotels that are already being used as long-term rentals um, and provide the services and support needed there. Um, and then the last um, item is the countywide zoning ordinance amendments. This was a project that um, we actually, it was one of the first projects we talked with the board and um, when we were starting the new housing program. And, and what we wanted to look at is kind of where are we getting in our way, dive into our policies, dive into our ordinances, dive into our codes, and figure out where um, we could make, um, you know, smart changes that would help reduce the constraints of development of housing or reduce um, the cost of housing development. So we have put a package together um, and that is um, uh, making its way through uh, the public hearings now for 
um, its uh, consideration by the Planning Commission and by the board. I um, mean, we're hoping to have that fully wrapped up by by the end of the year too. So, um, you know, I, I know everybody here is a lot right now. It, it seems to almost be raining money at the state. Um, and we are doing our best to, um, you know, get that money to Placer County so that we can support projects here. Um, and it is, um, uh, it's important that we kind of keep continue to hear from you. So, you know, at any point, anytime, you know, feel free to reach out. Uh, let me know if you've got some good thoughts um, or, you know, creative ideas where we can get, you know, more of our workforce housed locally. Um, in that North Tahoe area. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Crystal Jacobson, who's gonna talk a little bit more about the short-term rentals. Thank you, Shauna. Um, so as you can see, there are a number of actions that our board has taken or is considering um, to really address the housing crisis uh, in the Tahoe region. And um, just wanna to touch on one of them that they, that they took recently um, that was in support of, you know, preservation of workforce housing and really a way to uh, further address um, the housing crisis that we've got in, in the Tahoe area. So uh, this is a, a moratorium um, a, on short-term rentals, um, new, new short-term rental permits, I should say. This was enacted um, in July, uh, July 27th, uh, just, so just a couple of weeks ago, our board um, adopted an urgency ordinance to establish a moratorium on all new short-term rental permits. And so it's a 45-day uh, mor moratorium. Um, and again, it's just on new short-term rental permits. Um, and our, our um, short-term rental ordinance um, is, it only pertains to East Placer. So it's within the transient occupancy tax boundaries of Eastern Placer County. So the moratorium again was, um, is for a 45 day period. There are a couple of exceptions. Uh, the first is a renewal uh, applications for existing permits with no outstanding fees or violations. And then the second one is new applications that were submitted at least 24 hours prior to that July 27th date. So real quick, um, uh, if you don't know, our board adopted the, the short terminal ordinance back in November 2019. Um, and then in January 2020, it went into effect. We did do a brief update in March of this year uh, just to kind of clean up the ordinance. But it is a very, very new ordinance. Um, currently for this permit year uh, or permit cycle, we have permitted approximately uh, 2,411 permits uh, is where we're at right now. Uh, we do think that there are other um, short terminal operations that are out there that um, are operating without a permit. I'll touch on that here in a minute. Uh, but really it's a, it's a brand, brand new program. Um, it's had a number of challenges. We do think that there's uh, more opportunity to update the ordinance and so that that was kind of um, one of the reasons that um, the board took action to establish this moratorium. So real quick, uh, just to touch on the findings, um, these are the findings that the board made. Um, so they saw that, you know, after hearing from the community and hearing from staff, um, that there is a, uh, an exacerbated housing crisis in the Tahoe region. Uh, we do know there's an increase in second home ownership, um, a loss of long-term rentals we're hearing um, and significant you know, increasing workforce housing shortage. Uh, we've heard all kinds of stories um, about, you know, folks living in their cars. Um, we've seen it in our neighborhoods. Um, I know that the school has um, teachers living, living in their cars on the property there. And so it's been, it's definitely an acute problem. Um, and so the board found that uh, this housing crisis is really uh, pronounced uh, and it's one of the reasons for this moratorium. There's also a growing concern regarding the preservation of, of neighborhood character and integrity related to um, short-term rental nuisances, um, including noise, disturbances, tra traffic, and parking. Those are really the reasons why the ordinance was put into place in the first place back in November of 2019. Um, what we have found is that there's just been a growing visitation with, you know, over this last year with COVID. Um, and because of that, just a growing interest in STRs, and we have seen a lot of uh, concern about preserving these neighborhoods um, and uh, addressing the nuisances that short-term rentals bring to these residential neighborhoods. And the board also found, really, there's a current immediate, because of all this, there's a current and immediate threat to the public health, safety, and welfare associated with the proliferation of short-term rentals. Um, and then also, finally, um, the urgency ordinance they felt was needed to avoid uh, a rush or a major influx on permits so that we could focus on really review and revision of the ordinance and program. We do know, again, like I mentioned, 
Um, you know, we know that there are some challenges with the program. Um, and so we have actually been, um, you know, putting together a work program for an update. Um, and so this moratorium will allow us some time to do that. So just to touch on housing and statistics and takeaways and really what the board, um, you know, what was presented to the board and what they considered on the July 27th um, hearing date where they established the moratorium. We know that new housing units um, built in between 2010 and 2021, there was uh, 1,315 in the Tahoe area. Uh, we know that there was a decrease in owner-occupied units within that time. So uh, owner-occupied owner units decreased by 173, um, which is, you know, it's, it's concerning. The board found that concerning. Um, almost twice as many homes sold in 2020 as in 2010. I think everybody here uh, in Tahoe knows that, you know, the real estate market, there is a boom that we are seeing. Um, and so that factored into the board's decision making. And then half as many homes sold um, to owners claiming primary residence in 2020 as in 2010. So what we're seeing is an increase in the second home ownership. Uh, in the Tahoe area. And that's been ongoing for, you know, for a decade or, or, or longer, but really over the last, um, you know, this, this last year, we've, we've seen significant change. So just to touch on some um, statistics, housing statistics for East Placer, um, total housing units um, in East Placer is 15,747. Um, we, again, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, our permitted STRs uh, represent 2,411 of those housing units, about 15%. We also know that we've got another approximately 3% that either rented in 2020 or are renting without permit. So we have, um, we actively uh, try to bring folks into compliance. Obviously right now, you know, we are not um, bringing folks into compliance that aren't renting because they cannot, um, uh, we cannot issue permits at this time. Um, however, we do know that at any given time, we've got anywhere from two to 250 or so folks out there renting without a permit. So we actively track those. Um, those these numbers are constantly in flux. We also know that we have about 250 that rented last year that didn't renew this year. Um, so, so at any one time, we may have, we think, anywhere from 400 to 500 or so units out there that could potentially um, be renting now or rent in the future. So owner occupied units. So these are folks that claim homeowner exemption uh, represent uh, approximately 12% of that house total housing unit number in East Placer. And then vacant second home or long term rentals represent almost 70%. Um, so what's um, what we don't know here is the total number of our uh, long term rentals. Um, we would we would like like to know a little bit more about that, but we don't have accurate data on that. We do know um, in 2015 there was a the American Community Survey estimated that approximately eight to nine percent um, were long term rentals out of this total housing unit number. Um, but we think that that number may have gone down, and we won't have the new survey data until December. Um, so that number is a little little challenging to get, but. Again, what we do know is that vacant second homes and long-term rentals represent approximately 70% or so of the housing units in East Placer. So this slide just shows you um, housing STR permits and TOT uh, um, certificates by housing unit type. So you'll see here um, that TOT certificate number is a little bit higher in terms of the total permits here that you see at the bottom. And uh, the reason for that is that there is an exemption provision in our short term rental um, ordinance uh, where some units are exempt from, from having to um, obtain short term rental permits. So you see that number is a little bit lower. Um, and so that's really where the delta that you see here between these two is, is that number of exempt um, properties that do not have to obtain a short term rental permit. But approximately 75% of um, the units that are um, short-term rented are uh, single-family homes, and about 59% of those are the TOT certificates. So um, what the board um, is, is considering is for staff to be um, studying and you know, reviewing the short-term rental um, ordinance and exploring some um, revisions to that, to that code. Um, and so that is what we've been doing. We have been um, pulling together a work program 
um, for a short term, really a comprehensive update to our short term rental ordinance. And so revisions could address, um, you know, improved alignment with uh, the TOT certificate process. We have heard um, over and over again that it's, it's confusing um, that, you know, you have to get a TOT certificate and you also have to get a short term rental permit. Right now, the code reads um, where you get you get a TOT certificate before short term rental. We'd like to um, actually uh, swap that around so that you have to get the short term rental permit first and then you get your TOT certificate. Uh, there's just a lot of um, a lot of need for improvement um, in terms of how those two uh, areas of our um, the you know the TOT certificate process and the short term rental rental um, program interface. We also want to modify modify or clarify the exemption provisions. This has been the most challenging area of the code uh, for staff to uh, to navigate and implement. Um, and so we do think that there is um, definitely room for some change uh, related to the exemption provisions, provision process. Um, and then perhaps some expanded regulations to limit short-term rental um, permits um, in the county. And I'm gonna touch on this a little bit more here in the next slide, but a lot of jurisdictions are looking at um, you know, limiting provisions that would include something like a cap on total number of permits, um, you could uh, limit them by zone district. Um, you know, a lot of jurisdictions are limiting them to commercial areas. So there's there's different things that we could do with our ordinance to sort of further regulate where short-term rental permits um, are allowed or how many are allowed in the jurisdiction. So that's one way to kind of address um, the you know the housing issue that we're, we're seeing. Um, and then we do know we also need to adjust the short-term rental fees to align with program needs. So this is just looking at administration and enforcement costs to make sure that our fees are aligned correctly. Um, so just to talk a little bit about um, you know, issues and trends and kind of what's going on with um, short-term rental programs throughout the state and really actually nationwide, we see um, a lot of jurisdictions um, establishing caps or ratios to, you know, of long-term to short-term rentals. And these are a lot of those jurisdictions or communities that are resort communities and folks that are, you know, there's just an increased interest in short-term rentals and it's, it's impacting uh, workforce housing stock in these resort communities. And so, um, so we've seen, we've seen a lot of this. I'm going to, um, the next slide will show a little bit more about uh, other jurisdictions and what they're doing. Um, but what we have seen is um, they're doing things like limiting the proximity of short-term rentals to commercial and tourist tours or resort communities, um, clustering, they're establishing clustering prov provisions where you have minimum spacing requirements between short-term rentals and residential areas so that you don't have, you know, an entire neighborhood that, um, that is, you know, taken up with short-term rentals, limiting the number of short-term rentals per parcel limiting the size of short-term rentals, um, limiting minimum stays and occupancy. So there's a whole lot of, lot of ways that you could um, really kind of further regulate and limit um, short-term rentals so that they're not, um, number one, uh, you're preserving your workforce housing stock, but also that you, um, you know, you're, you're dealing with the nuisance issues that short-term rentals uh, do bring. So this just shows you kind of what other jurisdictions are doing. It's just a, a quick snapshot. We're working a little bit more on research um, to get a better handle on what um, other jurisdictions are doing and really kind of what they're finding and where, where they've had challenges. Um, but we know locally, um, this, the, the first um, kind of real limiting regulation came about through the um, city of South Lake Tahoe. So they have um, you know, regulations in place that limit uh, where short term rentals can go in their in their city and it's really limited to the commercial core areas. Um, and that was a citizen initiated um, effort, um, but they are now implementing those regulations. Um, County of El Dorado uh, recently established a cap and so did Douglas County. Um, and then you'll see a whole bunch of other cities here. A lot of them actually brought forward moratoriums. So we are not the first, count, first county or city to do that. Um, they've, you know, uh, other cities and counties have um, established moratoriums as a way to really pause, to get, take a, a pause on the program and study it. And just to make sure that, you know, our program um, is really balanced with, with our workforce housing needs that we have got in, uh, in Tahoe. 
Um, and so with that, just in terms of next steps, um, we are going back to our board on August uh, 31st uh, to consider an extension of the urgency ordinance and moratorium. And then again, um, as I mentioned before, we have been studying and putting together a work program for a real comprehensive update and just exploring code revisions that could be a part of that. And really, again, the overall intent is really to support and preserve residential neighborhoods in our workforce housing stock in Tahoe. So again, this is just one action that um, our board has, has taken um, to really you know, ad address the housing crisis that we've got in Tahoe. We've got a, a number of things going on as Shauna has already kind of touched on. Uh, and this is just really one, one tool in the toolbox. So with that, um, I'm happy to answer questions. I'm gonna go ahead and end the slideshow. Thank you very much, Crystal and Shauna. That was very informative and we definitely have a lot of questions coming in. Um, so we appreciate your time this evening. Um, and I'm gonna start and try to go back to some of the things, Shauna, you talked about first and then we'll come back to uh, short-term rentals. Um, there was a general question, if you could just uh, share more where exactly Hopkins Village is located in Placer County. Sure, so Hopkins Village is just off Schaefer's Mill Road up, you know, near the Truckee area by the airport. Thank you. And I believe in the Hopkins Village uh, discussion and regulation, Shauna, you mentioned um, it's folks have to earn 180% of AMI or below. Can you speak to why that metric was used? We got a question about that. Sure. So um, actually, so Hopkins Village is a partnership with the Hopkins Village um, property owners, the builders ourselves, and, um, and part of the MARTIS Fund. And so with that partnership, uh, the determination was, you know, the, the unit should be sold at about the 180 level. Um, but in saying that, um, 180 and less is 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 a, a big chunk of the um, kind of the missing middle um, based on the average incomes that we have in the area. So you know, surveying our local employers, um, that 180 um, max is um, a, is just a target market that we struggle to find housing for. Lower income, generally we can, you know, maybe find some subsidies or housing that we can um, help get that built. Um, above the 180, um, it's still tough. You really can get up in the Tahoe area to the two, 220, 240, um, and still be below market um, kind of incomes. But um, 180 is is a, a prime market that we felt this product product type, which is a half flex, three bedroom, two bath, half flex, um, really met. Thank you, Shauna. And we've gotten a few questions and comments uh, regarding ADUs. And thank you everyone for your feedback. We are noting it. So even if it's not a question, but uh, thoughts you have, thank you for sharing that. Uh, but there was a question, um, Shauna, about are there programs now or uh, potentially coming up soon to support folks who would be interested in building an ADU on their properties uh, for long-term housing if there was funding available? So the county has a great website. Again, placer.ca.gov slash accessory homes or just Google plaster and accessory homes pop right up. Um, there's a number of tools on there. There's an entire sheet of how to, um, it, we try to make it as simple as possible for you to come through. We also have the free plans available to you. Um, kind of our last piece of that puzzle. Um, well, I'm sorry, I should actually, we also have a, a, a direct person. One for her name is um, Megan Schwartz. She, we call her our ADU guru. She uh, knows everything in and out and she can help you you know, get through the process um, quickly and as easily um, through the, the, the planning process to get that done. The last piece that we actually are looking at doing is um, an, a finance tool. Um, and so we are uh, working with the um, Placer County Housing Trust, um, who is preparing a, a program where we would be able to support um, financially and offset the cost of the construction of ADUs, particularly for those that are willing to build them to um, house local workforce. Thank you. And so you mentioned uh, Megan Schwartz is your guru. Uh, we did have uh, one person comment that they maybe have had some difficulty getting through the permit process. So would that go on to this website and talk to this person? Absolutely. Her contact information is on that website. And so I, yeah, I encourage you to reach out to her. Excellent. And then 
Uh, Shauna, you also talked about the long-term rental grant program and potential incentives uh, for folks to convert uh, houses into long-term rentals. Um, can you discuss any more about what those incentives might be? So it is for to the homeowner. It's a financial incentive for each uh, uh, we're, the way we're, we're proposing or developing it. And it is a little different than the trucking model um, is that for each employee that is housed, um, there would be a, um, a, a, a stipend or an incentive that would be paid to that homeowner. Um, we're currently uh, looking at the uh, terms of those, whether six months or a year or some combination of the both. Um, but um, uh, that program is uh, scheduled to be to the board um, mid-September, either September 14th or at the end of September for their consideration. Thank you very much. And keep submitting questions if you have additional ones on ADUs or the long-term rental grant program. Uh, but now we're going to switch over and I'm going to start going through some of the questions uh, that we've seen come through related to the short-term rental ordinance. Uh, so Crystal, to you, has there been any discussion of limiting the number of permits someone or an entity can have? Um, and it looks like somebody provided a comment that uh, South Lake Tahoe recently prepared a cease and desist order to a specific company. Is this something that Placer County is looking at? We have, we've talked about that. Um, definitely talked about limiting them per parcel. And then we've had some conversations about limiting per, per person or per company, per entity, that kind of thing. Um, so I would just say it's on, a, it's on a list of things for us to explore. Um, and certainly, you know, as we would be, as we begin to prepare um, a code, re, you know, revision, uh, we would be, you know, going before the board and getting some direction and feedback on those various different types of ideas. But yes, that's something that uh, we have talked about. And I, I just say internally, staff has, staff has talked about that as, as one option, yes. Thank you. And, and while you're talking about opportunities where you'll be presenting to the board, we did a, get a question for um, if people have ideas or want to share more feedback, what's the best opportunity for them to share uh, feedback on uh, potential changes to the code? Yeah, so we welcome all feedback. Um, I can put my email into this into the chat and would welcome uh, emails. I, I would take phone calls as well. Um, so any and all feedback is welcomed. Uh, we will have a um, as we always do when we're preparing code changes, uh, do a robust outreach, you know, strategy or develop a robust outreach strategy for an STR update. Um, so, but yes, uh, welcome to email me directly um, or, or call me, but, um, and then uh, um, also on the August 31st date, we, uh, that'll be an opportunity for folks to weigh in as well. Thank you. Um, there was a comment uh, related to, you know, is, is there any, is the county looking at maybe targeting some smaller uh, properties like one or two bedrooms that might be better suited for the workforce uh, to focus the efforts on, you know, converting from short term to long term or things like that? Or as you're going through this, are you looking at size or types of properties? Yeah, I saw that. I saw that comment. And um, we are. Um, we, you know, but that was one of the items that I touched on that some jurisdictions are doing is sometimes they limit the size. But I would say we're, we're looking at size as it relates uh, not just to short term rentals, but also what is appropriate for workforce housing needs. Right. So um, and then looking at creative um, programs and solutions to try to uh, promote those units, you know, for for the use of uh, workforce housing. So, yes, yeah, size definitely factors in. And that's uh, just, you know, a, a part of the discussions that, you know, that staff has been having as well. Thank you very much, Crystal. Um, and I did want to circle back, Shauna, to you related to uh, ADUs. Um, is there um, currently any requirements? Uh, one person asked a question and said maybe in other California counties, they require that either the ADU or the main dwelling have year-round occupancy. Is this a requirement um, that we have in Placer County regarding ADUs? So currently, actually, under state law. ADUs are not um, uh, allowed to be used as short-term rentals, so they're the, the, the uh, they're only to be used as either a long-term rental or for the occupancy of the the property owner or the family, and that's that's also um, the Plaster County policy as well. Thank you very much. And a question, just kind of you know, 
we're looking to preserve housing for our local workforce and Supervisor Gustafson, this, this might be more of a, a policy one for you. Uh, you know, it, are you looking at any specific type of the workforce or looking at all levels throughout um, income brackets uh, that we're looking to serve with all these, these different programs? Well, absolutely. Um, I know the county has gone to 180% of median for that very reason. And we've also, um, I think TRPA, aren't they at 220% of median, Shauna and Crystal? Correct, yeah. And we actually go up to 220% on the Workforce Housing Preservation Program. It was only Hopkins Village that was at the 180. Great. Um, so yes, we're definitely interested in helping people at all levels of income from um, the lower income rentals all the way up to the managers and professionals, the doctors uh, in our community, being able to help them uh, purchase a home and be part of our community. Um, I know many of you've heard me say this before. I was so blessed that when I came here, I had friends uh, skiing all over the West and Tahoe was affordable. Um, I thought I had landed in heaven because not only did I get a winter and a summer season, but I could afford a house, not only a rental, but then I could save and buy a house. And so many of our young employees can't do that now. So we wanna make sure we see that progression so people can stay here and raise their families and settle down and be part of the fabric of our community. It's where so many of us uh, had that chance and we wanna recreate that through whatever mechanisms we can so that uh, we can kind of rebuild that sense of community that um, I think we're missing in many areas now. So, uh, but we're more than willing. And I did um, see a question about what are we doing for trying to recruit? I think what it meant, um, let's recruit higher paying jobs. Uh, and I, I, that's a great question. Our economic development board and many of our local business associations have talked about, can we diversify our economy? We know we have more and more uh, remote workers here uh, that are working for those higher uh, end companies or, or tech companies. Um, but we wanna make sure in our programs that we're focused on people that work for locally based uh, employers. If we're going to help them, we want them working uh, for an employer who's headquartered in within our school district boundaries. Am I right on that, Shauna? Yes. For the workforce absolutely. housing. Yep. Um, assuming that those that move here and are remoting into um, the tech companies and things uh, are some of some of the ones that have the funding to purchase homes already and have been doing so. And one other comment I was going to make, I just heard today from a different city manager that the city manager at South Lake Tahoe um, says that they're already seeing uh, with their short term rental ban, and we're not talking about a ban and we never have and I don't, I'm almost 100% positive we don't have the votes for that, but the moratorium may free up some housing and people have questioned whether that could really happen. Um, apparently at the city of South Lake Tahoe, there's been about 10 to 20% that have converted to long-term rentals from that were short-term rentals. Um, and I want to get those statistics to our board. The other thing, for those of you who know Dave Wilderotter, I ran into him at farmer's market today. Uh, he's, um, he was trying to purchase a duplex in Kings beach. Um, he was aced out by somebody else. And once, and they were in escrow and it fell out of escrow because of the moratorium. So he's uh, gonna purchase it and it's for his employees. So he wanted to make sure we heard that story and that I shared it. So short-term rentals are only one part of a very, very big puzzle. And it's probably a very small part, but it is something and it's something that we can regulate. But we have to be very careful about the impacts to so many of our longtime businesses and uh, owners that depend on those short-term rentals. So finding that balance is, is really critical and making sure we really flesh out all these other housing programs and get housing on the ground. Thank you, Supervisor Gustafson, well said. And it does appear we've gone through most of the questions that I've seen come through. If you have additional questions, please, you can still share them. 
Um, also, both Shauna and Crystal have shared their contact info in the chat. So if you have additional thoughts on uh, the short-term rental uh, updates or any of the programs Shauna discussed or any other great ideas, uh, we're all ears. Uh, you can pass them on to Crystal and Shauna. Um, and again, if you have more questions, feel free to pop them in the, the Q&A or, and or the chat, and we will try to get to them. Um, but I think, yeah, for now, we've gotten through everything we've seen. So at this time, thank you very much, Shauna and Crystal. And uh, Supervisor Gustafson, I believe you have a few additional county updates you wanted to provide this evening. <laughs> you know, I, um, I think the main one is as we progress through the fall, the main update I wanna share with everyone is um, I had the opportunity, as I said, to tour uh, the devastation of the river fire. And it happened on not a red flag day, but in an area that is a canyon with some amount of wind. And uh, we lost 48 homes uh, just above the Colfax area in Placer County. And then Nevada County lost 54 homes. Um, one of the stories that um, at the town hall was from a gentleman who uh, had done his defensible space, who uh, had a pump from a swimming pool and an inch and a half hose and was gonna try to fight the fire on his own. When the wind or when the flames came up the canyon toward his house, he said a gust of wind from very hot wind from the fire knocked his hat off. He turned around and got his hat. When he turned back around, there were embers and flames already starting on his deck. And so he immediately left. I, I share that to tell you how quickly these things can happen. We all know it. And I just urge everyone to be prepared and to follow the directions of when to leave and leave early. People are concerned about evacuation or get to a safe place as soon as you can um, so that the firefighters can get in. And uh, these roads in above Colfax were basically barely over one lane, um, very tight, much tighter than almost any of the areas we have here. And what a tremendous job all the firefighters have done. North Tahoe's crew was down there because my son was down there on the river fire. And I just, I thank everybody for being ready um, to go and following uh, those evacuation orders. At the town hall, the sheriff said, um, lives were saved because people followed those orders. And I know it's hard to leave your home in those situations, but your life is so much more important. So be ready, be prepared, and uh, thank goodness for Cal Fire. Um, we had an aerial, aerial assault on Colfax that rivals anything. I mean, DC-10s and helicopters, I think there was um, 300,000 gallons of retardant dropped on that fire, um, which really confined it because thousands of more people could have been impacted. In fact, they evacuated the whole town of Colfax. And fortunately, there were no, um, no structures in Colfax that were damaged. It was above in the county area that um, the homes were destroyed. So that was about it, Lindsay. Um, I'm sure there's more I can tell you about everything that's going on, but I think that's the most critical for tonight. And um, I just, again, thank everybody for uh, attending and being interested in this topic. If you have suggestions on other town halls you'd like to see or other topics you want discussed, um, please let us know. We are more than willing to pull together the experts from the county to talk about these issues and work with the community to serve you. So um, thank you to all the county staff who gave up their dinner hour or two <laughs> to, to be here and all of our public safety officials um, again, our sheriff's office and our firefighters, um, thank you so much for all you do to protect us. And with that, can we, were there any other comments? No other comments. Just thank you very much, Supervisor Gustafson, for putting this together. And you can email Supervisor Gustafson at placer.ca.gov. Any other questions, thoughts, concerns, comments? Uh, she always listens. I know she does. <laughs> So thank you all very much uh, and, and have a great evening. Bye, everybody. Yeah. Thank you.